every month we invite special guests who have vast experience in neonatology um, and which can help many of us uh, to improve ourselves. So this is the experts experience sharing session. Uh, I'm delighted today that uh, Dr. Kishore Kumar has agreed to come onto our platform to share his experiences. Um, brief about Dr. Uh, Kishore Kumar. Um, one second, just. So, Professor Kishore Kumar um, is from Bangalore, uh, Karnataka, and uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, very uh, key people who have uh, uh, changed the face of neonatology in this country um, and uh, has created uh, um, a separate vertical of uh, maternity uh, hospitals in this country, which uh, uh, provides high quality uh, uh, maternal and newborn care. Um, not only uh, academically oriented, um, uh, Professor Kishore Kumar has encouraged many other uh, neonatologists and entrepreneurs to pursue the passion of uh, uh, um, creating newborn units and scaling up the quality of care. In this respect, uh, um, I welcome uh, everyone to uh, listen to uh, 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 Dr. Kishore Kumar uh, about the journey and how do we look at uh, uh, um, you know, following our passion and what are the challenges that we face and how do we overcome that? I request everyone joining uh, to keep muted and whatever the questions that you have, you can type it uh, um, so that at the end we can ask the questions. Um, I welcome and uh, over to you, Dr. Kishore Kumar. Praveen did uh, send me <clears throat> some salient points which he wants me to talk. When he asked me to talk on this uh, on the 21st of June, sorry, July, it should say, um, I initially wanted to ask him what exactly wanted he wanted. Initially, he said uh, delivering high quality neonatal care. Then a uh, couple of days back, he sent these points. Is it possible to include how to follow up passion? challenges faced in pursuit of the same, dealing with rejection, role of teams in running NICUs, convincing people to invest in the vision, dealing with non-medical personnel management in the journey of organizational growth, and advice for younger doctors wanting to pursue their dreams. So <clears throat> I have prepared the presentation, hoping to answer all these questions which has been raised by Praveen in an honest way. Hopefully it will help some of you, if not all of you, and uh, as uh, Dr. Praveen has uh, suggested, this is going to be a little bit uh, <clears throat> different from the usual academic lectures. Now, just to give you the background, I did my MD. I did my MD from Davangere and I got a gold medal. And after that, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, <clears throat> specialize in neonatology. This was in 1989, and there was no uh, neonatology specialist training in India at that time. And PGI Chandigarh, under the leadership of Dr. Baku, had just started the DM neonatology, and they just had two seats at that time. Before that, anybody wanted to specialize in neonatology, used to spend three to four months in all India Institute of Medical Sciences, and used to come back and say, I'm uh, I trained in neonatology and I practice neonatology. So when in 1989, when they started DM, obviously with two seats for all over India being available, um, I had already planned to leave for uh, UK, but in those days there was no email and there was no fast uh, transit of various things. We had to apply for PLAB certificate. Once, once you get the PLAB uh, admission ticket, then only you will get the visa and those sort of things were there. So during this transition after the MD, I was working in Mission Hospital in Mysore as a pediatrician. And uh, we saved a baby who was 780 grams. 
presumably i didn't know at that time that was the smallest baby at that time for having been saved so my paper i mean my name was uh, printed in lot of uh, print media electronic media by the hospital mission hospital because they wanted a um, lot of publicity and they were very impressed with the work which i had done and they even promoted me to be the head of the department of neonatology at such young age inside me i was feeling very insecure i wasn't sure whether the baby survived against all the odds or was it my effort or was it a team effort <clears throat> and if somebody had asked me to replicate that success was i confident of replicating that success i wasn't sure so though they offered a lot of incentives to stay back and continue the good job i was doing i had determined to go to uk then i left the job and i went to uk why i'm telling this is uh, there was a lot of pressure at that time both my family and friends saying that uh, look you have already finished md you are re almost uh, reaching the age where you should start thinking about getting married and settle down how long do you want to keep on working because he going to uk was a very <clears throat> at that time was a very dodgy scenario because nobody knew whether you will pass the plab or not and um, even if you take the plab the pass percentage those days used to be 5 to 6% which i'm sure uh, pravin will agree what it means is uh, the pass percentage of plab exam those days in the uk was not related to your performance it was related to the job vacancy in the uk if the job vacancy in the uk was 3% pass percentage of plab was 3% if the pass per plab uh, job vacancy was 8% plab uh, pass percentage would have been 8% so anybody who passed the plab would be guaranteed to get the job so that was the way that used to work so in the sense if you are taking about 3% to 8% is the maximum pass rate you have to understand anybody who comes to uk economically it's quite a expensive trip and nobody is going to take the exam that easily what it means is there was lot of negative sentiments to go overseas and do the plab exam because you are not guaranteed that you will get the plab certification and if you don't get the plab certification you have to come back empty handed and tell people that you have failed plab and then you are going to stay so it was not an easy decision why i am telling all this is one of the points which uh, pravin uh, insisted on is i want to talk about my passion my passion was i wanted to train in neonatology so i decided against all the odds went to uk passed the plab and after passing the plab then we realized the next battle is on because in uk at that day at that stage you wouldn't have been able to get into a teaching hospital job nowadays it's called uh, uh, trainee jobs those days there was no such terminology it was teaching hospital job and non teaching hospital job so when i applied i went to interviews and everybody said uh, oh you're a foreign graduate you had to work for 6 months in district hospital to know how the system works before you can apply for a teaching hospital job so then i applied for a district hospital in um, london because i always dreamt of working only in london nowhere else i worked there for 6 months and after that i started applying teaching hospital job my first hospital was not a small hospital it was called university middlesex hospital which was next to heathrow airport so what i loved about the job is it was a university hospital but a small hospital at the same time i could see british airways taking off from terminal 4 every day which used to make me feel homesick so there was so much temptation to come back because it was winter when i went october and winter is the time when you get depressed and uh, after going there for a few months you realize that uh, pediatrics and neonatology because i had graduated from india and i was a gold medalist i had this ego that time the best in the world and you thought you can't learn anything more and you know winter is the depression you want to go back but i persisted 
after six months, I asked my consultant, can I get a job in a teaching hospital? And he said, no, no, you've spent only six months. You will work for one more year, six months, and then I will get you a job. So that time I got irritated and I said, look, I came here thinking that I want to work in a teaching hospital and I'm not going to work for more than this. If I can't get a job in a teaching hospital, I might as well go back because I have passed the lab, which means I'm equivalent to a British graduate. Now I wanted to know the system. I worked in the district hospital. If I can't get the job, I'm wasting my time. So then the consultant got uh, really sure that uh, this guy is not going to stay with me if I don't get him a job. The reason this is important is in UK, those days, the jobs were dependent on two factors. One is obviously your interim performance. Second is your reference from the existing consultant of the job which you are working. So my performance in the interview was only 50% success and the consultant's reference was 50%. So finally, I got into the teaching hospital job, which was a two years structured program involving um, Birmingham Children's Hospital. And uh, had I not insisted, had I not persisted, I think I would have landed up working in a district hospital. The difference is after I joined the teaching hospital, I learned pediatrics is so much different in uh, the UK compared to India. I was rotated through different departments like pulmonology, cardiology, hematology, oncology, respiratory medicine. And because I wanted to be a neonatologist, they gave me nine months out of two years in neonatology postings. So that two years when I finished, and neonatology was towards the end of my nine months, I had finished my MRCP, and uh, because it was a teaching hospital job, after that I was promoted as registrar stroke senior registrar. So I had to have two more years of registrar and senior registrar job when I was offered a job in Newcastle upon time. In Newcastle upon Tyne, I worked as a senior registrar, stroke registrar for neonatology for two years. So essentially I had spent four years, then I became a consultant neonatologist in Liverpool. So why I'm telling in such details is, had I not persisted, first of all, I would have not got into the teaching rotation, I would have not got into the learning job. Secondly, these days it's called CCST. CCST was not there at that time. And this made me eligible for CCST basically because I had worked in a teaching hospital and I became a consultant in Liverpool. Once I became a consultant in Liverpool, I was so excited and I've always been academic and I was presenting papers in national and international conferences. And I presented a paper in London Neonatology Conference uh, in 1993, which got me a best award of paper at in that year in London. There I met Victor Yu, the professor of neonatology from Melbourne, and who offered me a job to come and work in Australia, having been impressed with my presentation. I had always thought Australia, people don't allow and it's not easy to get job. When he offered me, my dream was always to work in Australia and the sea kangaroos. So I immediately took the job and I resigned Liverpool consultant job. Everybody thought I was a fool that I'm resigning for a consultant job in UK. And uh, I resigned the job. I went to Australia and I found that uh, Australian neonatology is much, much more advanced compared to uh, UK neonatology. So I degraded myself uh, voluntarily from being a, a consultant in the UK to being a fellow or a junior consultant in Australia, because those days in UK, they were not ventilating 24, 25 weekers. Whereas in Melbourne, in Monash Medical Center, they had a lot of IVF. There were a lot of patients who used to come from Middle East and they used to ventilate 24, 25 weekers. And I started seeing uh, babies being saved at 500 grams, 400 grams. So that gave me an in, in um, imparted sort of a solid training in neonatology because I think it was very well advanced. During that period, I even made an attempt to go and see how the neonatology in the US 
with the, by going to uh, hot topics and uh, I even got a scholarship and spent four weeks in um, Johns Hopkins. And I exposed myself during that one and a half year I worked in um, Monash Medical Center. I fell in love with Australia. So I wanted to extend my stay. And that's how I landed up uh, taking a job in Sydney, but I wanted to work in Sydney in a good hospital. So I took six months in pediatric intensive care and also six months in um, net service, which is called newborn emergency transport service. I'm telling you all this because I'm addressing Praveen's uh, request for uh, following my passion. So during that one year, I realized pediatric intensive care was not my cup of tea, though I enjoyed the job. I, it gave me more confidence to handle the neonatology intensive care. It also gave me a lot of confidence in handling congenital heart disease, both as neonates and post cardiac surgery, which I didn't have experience in the past. I fell in love that I missed the neonatology and I said, I can't do anything other than neonatology. Then I wanted to see the world. I went to Los Angeles. I took up a fellowship in neonatology in Los Angeles Children's Hospital. I started my job and passed my USMLE when I was in the US, UK and Australia. And I worked there for a month. What it made me realize is the neonatology in Australia and US were hardly different at that time. UK was trying to catch up and uh, India was far, far, far behind. During all this time, what I realized is the only deaths I used to see was less than 600 grams in, in intensive care or children with malignancy or road traffic accidents or called RTA. I never saw any deaths and I never saw any maternal deaths either. I've always been attached to India. So every year I used to come for pedicon and neocons. And I used to talk to people and say, look, I've been working here and there's absolutely no deaths. I don't know why we see so many deaths. And people used to say, look, uh, that's Australia, that's UA, US, UK. You can't do these things in India. Somehow I used to be skeptical and I went back. Then um, I always wanted to come back to India. But then somehow fate and my love for Australia fell in and I got a permanent job. And when I got a permanent job, they said you will have to pass the local FRSAP exam if you want to be considered as a consultant. So I landed up taking FRSAP exam and then I became a consultant neonatologist and I was practicing in neonatology. And uh, I became a consultant neonatologist in uh, Perth uh, during uh, my uh, Australian stay when I met uh, one of my Jewish colleagues called Fred Grog. Alfred Grog was the first neonatology professor in Australia. David Henderson Smart was the second neonatology professor in Australia. He was in Sydney. And the third neonatology professor <clears throat> was Victor Yu in Melbourne. So there were only three professors of neonatology in Australia. So when I worked at the Monash, I worked under Victor Yu. When I worked in Sydney, I worked under David Henderson Smart. Both were very, very academic and um, extremely interested in academics presenting papers and this and that. During my FRSAP stint, I worked in Tasmania in uh, Australia. So when I came to Perth as a consultant unitologist, one of the first thing Alfred Grog taught me is how much bank balance do you have? And I thought, oh, this was an odd question for a colleague to be asked. But uh, obviously he had some intention to ask that question. He asked me and I was honest and I explained to him and he just laughed. He said, you can't be an academician and have no money. If your children want to go to private school tomorrow, they will not give you a private seat. Assuming that you're a great academician, you have to earn your bit. And that opened my eyes. What do you mean? I said, he said, you have to start making money. Academics won't fill your stomach. But all these days I was following my passion and I had presented, presented, presented. I had almost reached 50 international news articles, I mean, articles presented in journals, various things. 
and i was thinking what is this guy telling me about so then that's when i started thinking about making the money and i started uh, my entrepreneurial gene and started kicked in so far what i had done is i had established an unit unit on the hub and spoke model in the uk in the liverpool i had established a unit intensive care unit in tasmania on the hub and spoke model under the government uh, job then when we came to perth though i was a consultant unitologist in um, government there was an opportunity to set up a neonatal unit in a private setup because all neonatal units in australia were public there was no private unit so when there was an opportunity that was advertised and nobody wanted to take it fred grog said come let us establish the unit and when he offered me i said okay and everybody thought we both were fools the reason being very simple by going to establish a private in unit unit we would not be getting a salary and will be under the mercy of private practice so everybody thought we were fools but we established a private unit unit and uh, we became very very successful we had lot of vip patients justin langer adam gilchrist were all my patients and uh, i became very vip in perth and we started moving around vip circles in fact uh, i had my convertible bmw i was leading a la- fantastic life and uh, they met helen clark the new zealand premier so by going to private i suddenly realized from just being a consultant unitologist in australia i had become now a vip and i had given got pro- professor of unitology given in notre dame for having established a private neonatal unit this private neonatal unit became very very successful it became so successful that i was nominated for one of the prizes and that's when i was felicitated by bill clinton in february 2006 for having been one of the youngest and highest qualified neonatologists working in australia and this turned the moment bill clinton said the one word we were given 5 minutes to talk to each other and bill clinton said where am i from i always said i am from india i never said i am from australia i am from uk because i was never a confused desi and bill clinton said oh india is the future of the world the middle class population of us is equal to sorry middle class population of india is equal to the total population of india so total population sorry middle class population of india is equal to the total population of us so you can imagine the spending power of india and it will be the future of the world i hope you can do something for your country that started thinking gosh i have been here for too long and i forgot and every year i used to talk about going back to india why am i not doing anything so this led me to think i have to think different about now all of you know that ganesha has been worshiped for whole centuries we always worshiped ganesha because we were told so but the younger generation will ask how did ganesha survive without a head and for so long and why blah 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 why elephant head was given so you had to think the same um you know th- uh, think about ganesha in a different way to convince the younger generation so we thought i have been working in the west and i had to go back and people are skeptical in india that we want to do this uh, you know reduce the number of deaths number of maternal deaths and every year if you look at the unicef outcome about uh, maternal and neonatal deaths india used to be on the top of the list so i felt my expertise having established neonatal units let us do a neonatal unit in india and show that these maternal mortality neonatal mortality can be reduced significantly the whole west was going from technology boom to technology boom and um, indians were going in um, drones uh, for establishing the millennium bug technology and various things and uh, western neonatal intensive care was so far ahead and we were lagging behind so we conceived this idea about cloud 9 and uh, everybody was excited 
when we talked about this, uh, you know, then the question started coming. Where do we start? How do we proceed? Whom to contact? What all we need? Will it succeed? See, when we did establish neonatal unit private and other things in the Perth, it was easy because every department had their own things cut out. So when we decided we wanted to come down to Australia, India and set up, India is a huge country and Bangalore being my hometown, I thought we'll set it up in Bangalore. And this was the year 2005, 2006, this was 15 years back. And if you look at it, IMR in India was still around 46, infant mortality rate in US was 5.94. And uh, even then US was not happy because they said 5.94 infant mortality is much higher compared to Scandinavian countries. So they actually described late preterm babies that year, 2005. Before that, there was no description of late preterm baby. So we, we came at a time when there was a lot of changes happening. President Obama became Obama president and Al Gore was nominated for Nobel Prize. So we started our dream project by talking to friends and family and all the other people. My mentor and my teacher said, it is high time you come back. You have been abroad for 16 years and you have to do, and you tell me what you want. And I said, we had calculated the budget. We realized if we want to fulfill our dream, we needed to have 20 crores rupees to start the project. So my teacher had two vacant sites in Bangalore. He sold it and he gave me the money. Basically, he gave me almost um, one crore rupees from two sites. And this is a teacher who was not very rich, but he had the confidence that I will succeed. My father was not a rich man. He gave me two crores. My wife and my children were supportive, but not happy. My wife was very happy, but my children were not happy to relocate to India from Australia. No child will be ever be happy to relocate back to India. Then I reached out to my extended family, my co-brother and my co-brother's partner, and they all agreed to pitch in. So finally, raising the 20 crores rupees was not a big deal. Once we reach out to people and we say we want money to do this, obviously you have to convince them for the business success trip and financials, which we did, but they expected returns also. So it was not a, as easy as just showing you one slide, but it took over a few weeks. Then the question comes, you are going to do this new one center, which is going to be state of the art. Now the question comes, everybody started asking is, oh, there are so many nursing homes. There are so many multi-speciality hospitals. In what way is your different? So we had to pour out whatever is in our head, how it is going to be different, how we are, how we are going to do. But we were not sure that this will succeed because I didn't know whether they will welcome us by embracing or will be ridiculed saying that it's unnecessarily making it a glamour. And if you look at the success of an unit unit, you need the obstetricians because obstetricians probably look after the pregnancy for the first 300 or 350 days. If the foundation is wrong, then the building will be weak. So you need a good obstetric team to deliver good babies and uh, achieve whatever you want to do. So we started talking to the obstetricians and knowing that these thousand days are important, though we had started talking about the thousand days, it was not until American Academy of Pediatrics published 1000 days in 2008. The world caught up with this word 1000 days, but we were talking about 1000 days in 2005, 2006. So how, what does it mean? Lot of things, unless a bigger organization starts doing, you may not get recognition. So once we decided to do this, then we decided how small the baby is going to be saved. 15 years ago, it sounds ridiculous, but most hospitals were not ventilating or saving babies less than 28 weeks in Bangalore. But I had the expertise from Australia and uh, we were very keen to save babies from 24 weeks onwards. When I spoke to the leading neonatologists in India at that time, 
everybody said less than 1000 grams we don't uh, try to save because outcomes are usually not very good secondly nnf had described as 1000 grams as viability there was no support from nnf or iip or ima in case if something were to go wrong we spoke to the lawyers from supreme court and high court and they said the viability in india is defined as 28 weeks and if you try to save some baby less than 28 weeks and if the parents decide to sue you you may be liable think about it before you do so there was only negative sentiments around and uh, the obstetricians are not willing to deliver the babies less than 28 weeks at that time i'm talking about 15 years back so then we started having a monthly meeting monthly meeting and re review meetings debriefing meetings we made obstetricians part of the meetings and many obstetricians thought they don't need to come for these meetings because they know everything and we started talking about medical legal issues it took us almost three months to convince the obstetrician that you can deliver babies at 24 weeks if the parents agree we started involving the dads by conducting antenatal workshop educational classes are showing literature about the prematurity in case if they have premature babies so we started building the base starting from the parental support obstetrician support by conducting various classes and various things we also talked about uh, fertility services and many fertility cases in bangalore at that time if they conceived twins or triplets the popular thing was to reduce the pregnancy to single pregnancy by fetal deduction nobody was allowed to deliver twins gunshila was very popular in that way reducing the fetal uh, twins to single and fetal reduction which i had never heard of in australia and uh, uk for 15 years was a big phenomenon in bangalore and uh, nobody would uh, contemplate delivering twins premature because they would have been reduced so we started having parental workshops um, educating them about uh, lamas and prematurity and uh, we created some excitement by creating management of baby affairs which we patented we registered the management baby affairs so that people don't copy this and so all in all we created cloud nine over a period of one and a half year of hard work before we can get proper premature babies the challenges when we started was starting from convincing the obstetricians getting the infrastructure the thing was the infrastructure when we started constructing we had mental picture of how the maternity and newborn care should be so when we were building the building we had almost uh, uh, built the ground floor and ground floor was going to be opd and my office and other things which if you're not seen in jayanagar come and see and then the first floor they had built uh, 20 rooms i was traveling in between perth and bangalore at that time once a month and i came one day and i saw three feet wall had been built with 20 rooms and i said this is not the concept i had i can't have 20 rooms in one floor that doesn't allow mother father staying in a room breastfeeding chair to be allowed and counseling to be a room so i said i needed bigger rooms when i look at the floor plan we could accommodate only 12 rooms with my thought process so the architect and the engineer said oh this guy is pure academician he's crazy he will never break even so this was the things which was conveyed to investors so the investors got a little bit weak on legs and said why you want 12 rooms instead of 20 because the business is going to be better if you have 20 deliveries rather than 12 deliveries finally when i convinced uh, the investors about my thought process they agreed and we changed the rooms to 12 rooms and huge rooms catering for all the things we started lactation support 
on day one so that we will have breastfeeding success with everyone. And we definitely wanted every mother to successfully breastfeed. And we trained our nurses to breastfeeding. And we also extended home care at home to reduce the cost of the delivery so that uh, these sort of things can be continued and physiotherapy to be tuned. So, in essence, we had conceived Cloud9 to be a world class facility, which we had to replicate whatever is in our mind to on the ground. And this is what we got. Then coming to NICU, we wanted to be the best infrastructure. And at that time, unfortunately, many of the equipments which are now available now was not available. And um, we had to go through a lot of negotiations to get these equipments to India because giraffe ventilator incubator was costing almost 13 lakhs per incubator, whereas a normal Indian made incubator would have costed only 1.5 to 4 lakhs maximum. Because it was three times the cost, GE was not importing many, not many being sold, and most people said it was useless. The closed care incubators or closed care system of looking after a baby was a new thing in India because most of the centers, including the so called teaching centers in India, were used to open care systems wherein they look after the babies under the open warmer. <clears throat> Giraffe was one of the incubators which had a capacity to convert open care to closed care, closed care to come open care. It had the flexibility. And most neonatologists in India and at that time when I spoke to them were not comfortable using humidity to look after a baby who was 24, 25 weeker. So bottom of line is everybody the investors spoke to said, you're wasting your money for buying an incubator at 12 lakhs when things can be bought at 2 lakhs or 3 lakhs. So then there was pressure from the incubator, I mean, the investors for me to buy cheaper incubators rather than giraffe. Eventually it took almost 15 days for me to convince them and buy the giraffe incubators. Because if you want to look after 24, 25 weekers, you need absolute control of humidity and various things. And that determines the outcome of the babies. So finally, we created a world class infrastructure of NICU and the world class operational theater and a labor room, which should look like five star hotel so that the patients don't feel that they're coming into a hospital. Once we created the infrastructure, we also wanted them to come and spend leisurely time because pregnancy is wellness, not an illness. And that's our uh, tagline was when we started. So when it's a wellness, when you come to the hospital, you should not feel it's a hospital. You should be able to wander around, have a cup of coffee with your partner, enjoy your time and go back. And that's how we created the cafeteria. And uh, we even uh, went and uh, met the these Abope people in Boston because they didn't have a franchisee and we had to bring the franchisee into India and created Abope cafeteria in cloud nine. Once we did all that, we had to keep uh, the excitement coming. If you don't have the patients, you can't uh, succeed. So we wanted to attract the patients. So we started creating programs um, like baby shower, antenatal classes, pregnancy um, competition, and we created a photo shoot for uh, babies as soon as they were born, family photograph. So these are all attractions to create and attract people to come and uh, deliver in cloud nine so that we will have a number of babies, otherwise become a luxury uh, center with no patients. Fortunately, our plan worked and we started having Increasing number of uh, parents wanting to come and deliver in cloud nine with all the activities we did. And that led to a um, lot of positive feedback. We started kind of collecting the feedback and acting on it. And uh, we definitely started uh, writing blogs and uh, getting more attention. And we certainly started having more babies. 
Once we started having more babies, that's when we started getting premature babies. So I'm just going to go through a couple of scenarios which helped us to initial stages. There was a 39 year old primary gravida with a husband in Merchant Navy, which means that uh, husband will be out in the sea for six months and they came to inquire about antenatal classes. Because of antenatal classes, they came to cloud nine and they had an uneventful pregnancy until 30 weeks. When she came to inquire in antenatal classes, she actually went into the spontaneous labor at 30 weeks in the lobby. And she delivered in the lobby very quickly, 980 grams baby. And this was the baby which is on the top left corner. And uh, we quickly took the baby to intensive care because it was 980 grams in 30 weeks. And then we realized the baby had a tracheal fistula. So then we had to go through the whole surgery and recovery and ventilation and we saved this baby. This mother being a German teacher in the one of the schools became a mouthpiece of uh, how well we had saved this child because our relative who had a baby who was 32 weeks had died in another corporate hospital in Bangalore just a year earlier. So she was very, very grateful and also she became a mouthpiece of cloud nine in the initial stages. Now this child is 13 years old along with cloud nine and she stands first in mathematics in the school called NAFL, which I'm sure many of you are aware. And she's, she's still a very fascinating child. And uh, this was our first uh, sort of what we call as a success. The second child which came about was a 32 year old married for four years, conceived two cycles of IVF, and she was pregnant with 26 weeks twins, and uh, sorry, 26 week uh, baby, estimated weight was 600 grams, and she went into labor. And because it was 26 weeks for our luck, she had been refused admission to deliver in two other hospitals or nursing homes locally. Um, the negative sentiment, which I explained earlier, was still there, but uh, these parents being desperate for the saving, they came to cloud nine because they had heard through a friend that there is a neonatologist who may be mad, who may try to save your baby. So then we explained the risks and other things and we saved this baby and this baby is now 10 and a half years old and doing very well. Then we got another lady who was 35 years old. She had Gravida 4. Para nil, she had no living children, married life for eight years, infertility treated for six years. She was pregnant with twins at 24 weeks. And at 24 weeks, when they did the scan, there was a huge fibro at 10 by 10 centimeters. Estimated weighing um, of fibroid is three kgs. It was pressing on one of the twins legs. I'm sure whether you can see here. If you see this, this was a dislocated knee. This was a uh, so <clears throat> looking at this, she had been advised to terminate her pregnancy by one other hospital, which I won't name here. So they came desperately and they delivered with us. Now the both the children are uh, 11 years old girl and both of them are learning Bharatanatyam. Though the girl with the um, dislocated knee had to have a couple of surgeries for the dislocation they both are doing extremely well, having done Bharatanatyam now. So the press coverage for us increased uh, proportionately, saying that the hospital increases survival rate for premature babies. And we started getting fantastic cover within a two years. We even held our first parents of premature uh, day in 2012, which coincided with having um, saved 100 babies less than 28 weeks at that time. So when we did all this, naturally, there will be jealousy. A lot of the local nursing homes and hospitals started spreading rumors saying that Cloud9 is very expensive. They do only C-sections and uh, they don't do any normal deliveries. So if you want to have a C-section, go to Cloud9. Or if you want a bill to be 2 lakhs, go to Cloud9. So the negative publicity started in a big way to affect us to the extent that we had a drop in the number of 
<clears throat> deliveries happening and certainly it was a concern but we persisted with uh, our work and uh, eventually it led us to a lot of copycats being started and the first copycat was actually bangalore only it was a chain created by a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, called motherhood which i'm sure all of you are aware and then rest is the history so why i'm telling the name here is it was very clear that um, somebody copying you is good because that shows that you are being successful and you're actually leading uh, the uh, way in a way but <clears throat> I didn't want to take too much of time but without telling uh, uh, all the things. That's why I had to tell all the details as I had promised to Praveen. And uh, it was not an easy win in the first two years, but subsequently the third year when we were so popular, a lot of other people started copying our business models because it had become so successful. And for a person who has a lot of money, 20 crores to start a hospital is not a big thing. So this is when we realized if we stay in one center, we are going to be taken over by the opponent. So we needed to expand. That's when we actually started looking for private equity to raise the funds to start replicating the models all across Bangalore and possibly India. And that's when we started after three years of hard work, when we made a name, we made a success, then we went to private equity, took the private equity and definitely went ahead with the opening more branches. And that's when we started creating branches because people had said, you can't do this in India when we started practicing cloud nine. Then they said, oh, you always sit in cloud nine in Jainagar. So it's easy to do where you are there. Once we showed that it can be done, then they said, you can't do anywhere else. When we started opening two other centers, the first was Old Airport Road and then was Malayshram. Then they said, you can do in Bangalore, you can't do anywhere else. Then we opened a branch in Chennai, then Mumbai, then Pune, then Gurgaon, then Chandigarh. When we showed our success, people became convinced now they've started copying more and more our models and expansion similar to ours. So we became a role model in a way for establishing the maternal and neonatal uh, chain of hospitals starting from scratch in a matter of few years. Had we not done that, people would have thought, you know, neonatal care and uh, maternity care is appalling in India. Whenever we went for any national conference or any international conference, India was never taken seriously. Now, at least the private sector is being taken seriously and people know that the private sector can do wonders as good as uh, um, you know, Western neonatal care in India. The other thing which we did is from day one, we started newborn screening in, in cloud nine. And this was another thing which I was very passionate about. In fact, I was responsible for uh, increasing the newborn screening from uh, five diseases to 56 diseases in Australia, because what happened is we had a child with uh, medium chain acetyl coa diagenesis, otherwise called MCAT deficiency. When we diagnosed one child with MCAT deficiency, I became very excited because I had worked in pediatric endocrinology department in Newcastle upon time in UK under Professor Ainsley Green. Ainsley spelt as A-Y-N-S-L-E-Y. If you Google his name, you will know that he was the father of metabolic disease in the UK. I had worked under Professor Ainsley Green and I was passionate about MCAT disease. When we first diagnosed MCAT disease in Australia, it was not routinely being screened at that time. When we asked for government funding, the government refused, saying that it's such a rare disease and we don't think we need to do. So we went on the TV and Australian Broadcasting Corporation came and interviewed me. And when I interviewed me, spontaneously, it came to me words saying that, John Howard was the prime minister at that time in Australia. And I said, the money required is one year salary of John Howard. It can save so many babies. We had that statistics. 
So it, it became a headline in Sydney Morning Herald because one year salary of John Howard can so many babies. The pressure was so much on John Howard that he gave the funding to put newborn screening, including metabolic disease, immediately. So the MCAT deficiency started being screened in Australia from that year onwards. So that's how it started. So I was passionately involved in newborn screening. So when we started newborn screening on day one, there were a lot of pediatricians in South Bangalore who used to tell their patients, it's a waste of money. These diseases don't exist in India. I'm talking about pediatricians telling this in Bangalore in, um, when we started. The other problem what we had in uh, newborn screening was there was not a good lab in India at that time, apart from Metropolis in Bang Delhi. And when we started sending samples, we got 10% of our results as a false positive results. This was it 15 years ago. If you get 10% of results false positive, it will kill the program. And I didn't want the program to be killed. And clearly, newborn screening need to have less than 1% of false positive results. Fortunately, because of my active involvement in newborn screening, I had links in Adelaide and New Sydney. I went and met both of them. I made an extra trip and I convinced the Adelaide people to do newborn screening from Cloud9 samples and subsidize the value. So we sent all our newborn screening samples to Adelaide for first five years. Because we didn't have adequate numbers, we tied up with the Rainbow Hospital in Hyderabad and also Fernandez Hospital in Hyderabad and also <clears throat> few nursing homes in uh, Mumbai. With that, we could get enough samples to send once a week and get the results. And that's how we started newborn screening in uh, cloud nine. The education which we used was baby seen at birth physically looks normal, but biochemically and semantically may or may not be normal. And unless you test these babies, you will never know. And over a period of time, gradually, every hospital in uh, Bangalore at least started copying our results after some time because people started asking for this. And this was not a normal thing 15 years ago. So then we gradually said we have to stop sending to Adelaide because there is a delay in the diagnosis of some of these babies because we used to send once a week. And by the time we got results, it was two weeks. So then we started uh, sending biochemists to get trained in Adelaide. And that's how we set, set up a lab um, here. And then we started sending the samples locally. Hearing screening is another story because hearing screening was a common practice in Australia at that time and in US. When we wanted to start hearing screening in Bangalore in cloud nine, there was nobody selling hearing screening equipment. So we got NATUS equipment from Australia and started hearing screening on day one. But unfortunately NATUS at that time didn't have an office here. So we had to send every year for calibration to Australia which meant we lost the equipment for almost three weeks, even though we sent by courier and we had a backlog of three weeks. And uh, during that three weeks, we missed one or two babies with the deafness. And those parents were very, very angry saying that we came to cloud nine and we thought we were getting comprehensive care, but then my child's deafness was not picked up. So from day one, though it was not there at that time as a standard policy, when we introduced, we became a target of a lot of angry parents for missing because we didn't have calibration. Nowadays, you get everything available in, in Bangalore and you get most modern things. So yes, over a period of five years, we revolutionized maternal and neonatal care in India and we had 0% maternal mortality. Our survival for babies was 99.72 uh, at that time. So we started making headlines and uh, people started coming and we multiplied the branches in all around the India. And we understood nothing is permanent because this is a hospitality industry. We have to be at it all the time, 24 bar seven, if you want to keep, otherwise the negative sentiments, as I said, from the, your own colleagues in and around in the city was that cloud nine delivers only by C-sections. It is very expensive and started doing the damage. So you have to be constant care, compassion, celebrity, everything you have to do. 
and uh, we did that persistently to sustain ourselves and retain our number one position. In fact, um, our um, model has been so successful that a uh, lot of Chinese came and saw our model and uh, replicated that model in China. And our model was copied and replicated as a Femina hospital in Hyderabad uh, in the early stages, then birth rate as uh, another hospital in Hyderabad. Then a lot of uh, other chains in Bangalore were uh, result of uh, looking at our success. So what makes me feel happier is at least we have improved maternal and neonatal care in a private sector in a big way because of um, the thought process behind what we did in cloud nine. So I think I've taken enough time. I promised to talk for one hour, which I have done. And now if you have any questions, I sincerely will answer promptly without hiding any fact. Over to you, Praveen. Praveen? Hello. Um, there was some uh, in audio. So thank, thank you so much uh, for taking us through the journey uh, uh, um, uh, of a neonatologist uh, and uh, running the successful venture. Um, there are some questions in the chat uh, box. So first is uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Do you miss academics and teaching? Have you faced any ethical dilemmas in uh, your administrative decisions? There are two components to it. Um, I, you know, first one is about uh, how much do you miss your academics and teaching because of your other uh, engagements? No, <clears throat> I don't miss academics and teaching because I do academics and teaching even now. I do go to Indira Gandhi once a week and teach the PGs there uh, once a week. Academies, we have started Raji Gandhi, IAP, IAP and NNF fellowships, and uh, we do teach uh, even, even in cloud nine. We have uh, <clears throat> weekly um, Cisco meetings or Zoom meetings uh, with all cloud nines. For the last three years, regularly, we do journal clubs so that there is nothing, not an academic thing which we miss. And we are part of the Vermont Oxford network for the last two years. And our data has been compared to Oxford and Vermont data. Now we have been very, very academic from day one. And we have published uh, 45 papers in last 15 years in uh, from Cloud9. So we have been very academic. So we have uh, our own research department. In fact, now we have got five research projects, international research projects going on in Cloud9. Um, so we are part of the torpedo study. We are part of the year study. We are part of DHA supplementation in pregnant, all in collaboration with Canadian universities, Australian universities. So there's absolutely no question of missing academics at all. My administration work is mainly in the evenings and early mornings. And I cater in such a way that 10 to 4, I do academics. And after 4 and before 10, I do my administrative work. But that was initial stages. Now. We have a fantastic team. We have created a team who are well versed with the running of the cloud nine. So it's auto almost on autopilot mode. So my administrative input is very minimal and I spend most of my time in academics and uh, teaching. Over to you, Praveen. Yeah. Um, so the next question is about uh, um, how, what strategies uh, do you use to convince the stakeholders uh, to listen to your vision, like obviously when you want a, a higher level of quality of newborn care, like you mentioned, uh, it could be the equipment or it could be the place requirements. Um, not everybody will uh, buy into that. So do you have any strategy how you convince them? See, that that's where I think I borrow the word from uh, Praveen. If you have passion, you can do anything. It all depends on how much passion you have, how well you can convince your investors. First of all, anything you do, it all, <clears throat> you have to be convinced with what you are doing. If you are not happy, if you are not convinced with what you are doing, you can't convince somebody else. So <clears throat> the answer is 
if you don't have that what it takes then you can't do it you have to convince yourself that you can do it you need to have that confidence if you don't have the confidence you don't have the passion it's very difficult to convince a second person that that i'm very very sure okay so thank you so basically you convince yourself and uh, then you will start convincing others next question uh, interesting one like i'm not sure the names are not coming up there but uh, this is about uh, 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 maybe because many of the audience are younger between 30 to 40 age group they are looking towards building a careers for themselves the question is about do you still feel uh, there is a need for mother and child hospitals in bangalore is there a gap in delivering healthcare practices in mother and child units and do you think uh, the bangalore mother and child units are getting consolidated in managing the patient so essentially is there any uniqueness left in maternal and uh, child health care uh, uh, still and uh, can somebody be looking at filling those gaps that's a fantastic question uh, praveen see what we did is when we started we wanted to cater <clears throat> obviously the way we started catering because of the high-end equipment high-end uh, infrastructure we started catering for the upper middle class people now the question is is there enough things and the answer is there is still quality of care that can be done in um, lower middle class lower class in other words we have only captured five star uh, segment we, we still have two star three star four star areas which can be captured easily now if you look at um, bangalore for example there are uh, the obstetrician fees for a delivery can range anywhere from depending upon which area and which which obstetrician you're talking about can range from 3000 rupees to 35000 rupees if you pay that kind of a fees then it's very very difficult to do a cheaper delivery so in other words there are lots of things you can do in reducing the cost in reducing the package deals and uh, affordability to the uh, lower middle class middle class so india is a huge country i mean bangalore might have been consolidated for the upper middle class uh, in a way because we have got too many brands now catering for the same segment but we haven't saturated uh, the maternity. Um, let me answer this question in a different way. When we started Cloud9, we had done a market research. And what we found was for the class of people we are catering to, we needed to deliver at least four babies a day to break even. At that time, Bangalore had 600 deliveries per day. If you take whole of Bangalore city, according to the registered uh, births uh, in the BBMP. So we were looking at capturing four babies a day when we started Cloud9 15 years back for our level of expenditure. So that means you still have 596 babies who are not being catered to. So with the current brands, everybody, you may be catering to 100 babies per day. You still have another 500 babies who can be catered in a different segment. So the answer is, no, it is not saturated. We still have plenty. We still have maternal mortality of 113 per thousand, which needs to come down to single digit. We still have infant mortality of uh, 32, which needs to come down to single digit. And the only people who can do that is pediatricians like us. Yeah. I mean, over to you. So, yeah, excellent. I mean, that's what uh, the same, uh, uh, what you are talking about, uh, Kiran, uh, our Kiran More, neonatologist from Sidra Hospital, uh, um, he is asking one question, Kishore, that yeah. how can we make this model work out as very cost effective NICU for even non affording class of people uh, can utilize it? How can we address patient from all strata in one setup? There are like, you know, the question is like about catering to the uh, 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 lower socioeconomic, and can you cater to them within a one setup itself? You can, you can. I mean, in fact, uh, we don't uh, uh, we don't announce uh, saying that uh, we do cater for uh, um, all the people. 
but we have had so many babies whom we have saved who couldn't afford uh, in the past. There is what we call as a crowdfunding, which is available, which can cater for your needs. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you have to understand that uh, not everybody can pay and you'll have to forgo uh, your fees. Um, so essentially you are working for nothing to save the baby. We have done that many times in the past. So it can be everything money, but uh, you, you can't be working with no money also. So there is a book by uh, CK Prahalad, who was the best economist uh, uh, from India, but he was working in the US called Bottom of the Pyramid. I don't know whether how many of you read that book. It is a fantastic book, which uh, caters and explains of how you can be successful if you treat large number of patients from the middle class or lower class. So what we are catering is tip of the iceberg and you still have the iceberg to cater to. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I also uh, strongly recommend that book for everyone to read. Um, I, you know, Kiran, the other thing is the lower socioeconomic. There are some models who have tried like Life Springs from Hyderabad uh, uh, um, as well. Uh, but uh, clearly you really need to look at unit economics and uh, uh, understand the market who you're getting to because healthcare is not going to come as cheap, but like as Kishore said, somewhere the funding has to come and there are different uh, ways of trying to get that. Um, 